Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we return to this portion of our study this week, shall we thank our Heavenly Father for his blessing and for his guidance? Shall we thank him for the ways in which he is addressing things for us so that we might be able to more clearly understand all that he would have us to know at this time and so that we might be able to give a defense for the faith that is in us. Shall we now ask him for his guidance as we approach the throne of grace? Loving Father in heaven, we see our great need of you. We ask, Father, for your forgiveness of our sins, for your direction and guidance as we look to open your word and to understand words that have been written. May your will be done. May your guidance become clear in our minds. Show us, Father, that which we should understand. Direct our paths. Help us today. I thank you for each one that is joining in this study. I praise you, Father, for the different ways in which you are leading us and bringing us together. Bless us today. May your spirit attend us so that our minds might truly be open. May your angels also surround us so that we may approach and understand more of what it takes to truly worship you and do that which you would have us to do. Thank you, Father, for hearing this prayer. Guide us now, we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now, when we ended our study yesterday, we covered these two sentences. In the kings of the south and the north, we find two specific entities that are raised up as a check against the ideologies of the papacy as expressed in both the civil and the moral. These two kings are not at war with themselves, neither are they satanic, but rather they are godly in nature and are raised up as a check to meet the ideologies of the papacy. Now, for all that Glenn has been writing in his papers, this one point struck me very hard because this is not the way that we have studied in the past. And this idea is very foreign to me directly. Yeah, it seems to me what he did is he came up with this idea that maybe the king of the north and the king of the south are fighting against the papacy and that that maybe they were godly powers. And, and he's worked everything to fit into that idea. Like, that's the only way that I can I can understand how he has constructed this. That is, he has started with an idea and bent everything to fit that idea. But it doesn't really fit. Well, the, the problem that I have in this, in keeping with Miller's rules, this would be a private interpretation. Okay, well, I understand private interpretation means without the use of the Holy Spirit, if that's what you mean. That's exactly what I'm getting at. Not that just one person believes it. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so this, I mean, no one would just think that, that there's any indication that the king of the north and the king of the south are godly powers. One is they're being typified by by the king of the north and the king of the south in Greece, right? Now, if you were arguing that, well, Christ is the true king of the north, and so, you know, that this is Christ fighting, you know, that, that, that now instead of dealing with the king of the north in the context of Daniel chapter 11, right? So in the context of Daniel chapter 11, when we talk about the king of the north, initially we're talking about a battle between the north and south, of Alexander's kingdom, right? Correct. So to to place in the co- that context that, well, Christ is the true king of the north, and so now he's going to be introduced as the true king of the north, you would need a lot of things to show that. Right. Right, which, which we don't have, because the natural context would be, oh, it's going back to what it had been talking about earlier, the king of the north, and it's also mentioning the king of the south. So you would you would you would naturally think by comparing scripture with scripture that the north and the south, even though they may not be because we're further on in time, they're not going to be Greece. They're going to be typified by what happened in Greece. 
So, so we would have to know that. To say now that they typify godly powers, you would have to have some precedent. You would have to have some way in which, not just that the king of the north, which is Christ is the true king of the north, you would have to have a godly power that's the king of the south. Somewhere in scripture where it tells us, you know, some godly thing is the king of the south, which we have no example of. And he's not providing any examples of this. So it, it just is not, it's not logical. It's not something that that comes from a study of Daniel chapter 11 itself. It's just an idea placed upon the scripture. And, and I would think that that's probably where he started with his study, is he came up with this idea and he made everything fit it. I could be wrong, but that's the way it seems to me. That's how he's constructed his study. Now, as he chose to proceed, he wishes to use the following verse as a support for his premise. But his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord, and he sought an occasion against the Philistines. Now, in this particular paper, he's had a, a, he's had a real difficult time using the pronouns he and his. Mm-hmm. And by pulling this verse out of context, he wants us to consider that this with these kings are of the Lord. So I find it ironic. Yeah, and there's no way that we can make a connection between what he's saying and this verse. Correct. Now, to proceed with... What, with what he wants people to understand will be his next article. The system of monarchy having been removed, a new strategy must be implemented in order to effectively influence the affairs of the nations. What worked for Satan in the scattering time could no longer accomplish his purposes in the gathering time. Therefore, he comes to us in a new form, that of apostate Protestantism. Apostate Protestantism has almost fully matured into spiritualism and is the power that is now on the ground against God's people. It is especially calculated to counter God's people during the dispensation of the gathering time. This is the power that should put us on extreme alert as it is invested with the same power as the preceding persecuting powers before it. We need always to remember that this third persecuting power has the same target in view as the two preceding powers, that of God's people. It is no friend to Adventism and is an absolute enemy to be feared. This transition from the mother to the daughters is found in Daniel 11.38 and is the subject for the next article. Now, we did quite a study regarding Daniel Mm 11.38. There's quite a number of things that we addressed. I don't think that Daniel 11.38 could be applied for a transition from the mother, the Catholic, or the papacy, to the daughters, Protestantism. I think that his premise here is poorly stated. Well, it's wrong. But you, you can see how in sort of when you get rid of the details, how you can, what he calls the minutia, you can actually sort of mold things however you want to with just ideas, right? So he creates a narrative or an idea that, that is connected to things that we would know to be true, but he... He molds them because he's ignoring details. And then he's going to do a study, as we'll see here, where, again, he ignores all kinds of detail. And, you know, I guess it would be like, uh, um, you know, an impressionistic painting where, you know, you could look at it and see it one way and you look at it and see it another way. There's no details there. And so it could, depending on, on how you look at it, um, you could you, you could see it as a completely different picture, right? But once you have all of the details there, 
you can only get one picture from it. Correct. Now, the next article, I'll shift to that one. Okay. Has this come up on the screen? No. Article 20. You got the article open? Because you have okay, it. Just a moment. I have it. I have it open. So just a moment. Yeah, and I have queued up here uh, what we did with Daniel 11, verse 38. Okay. So we followed Miller's rules to interpret the verse. And he's just going to focus on one word without actually looking at, at uh, like using Miller's rules to figure out who the god of fortress, forces is. Right. The topic of this article brings us to the last link of the three great persecuting powers of God's people. This power is no longer confined to the conditions of the scattering time period of paganism and papalism, but is specifically brought to bear against God's people as they are being gathered under the banner of the third angel's message. Apostate Protestantism is the third and the last of the three great powers that are especially deployed against God's people. Likewise, the Holy Spirit is the third of the three great powers of the Godhead that will be poured out on God's people in the closing work of the gospel. Christ is gathering the people to be with him for eternity, just so Satan is doing the same. The dispensation in which we are now living is to be, to those that ask, the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. Review and Herald, March 2, 1897, paragraph 13. From General Conference Bulletin, March 4, 1895, paragraph 4, God will inspire his loyal and true children with his spirit. The Holy Spirit is the representative of God and will be the mighty working agent in our world to bind the loyal and the true into bundles for the Lord's garner. Satan is also with intense activity, gathering together in bundles his tares from among the wheat. It is not just Adventists who are looking for a special endowment of the Holy Spirit to accomplish their final work, but in fact, this third persecuting power is itself praying for revival and for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. These prayers will not go unanswered. The question is, which spirit is answering? Here, he wishes to combine passages from early writings and from the great controversy. I turned to look at the company who were still bowed before the throne. They did not know that Jesus had left it. Satan appeared to be by the throne, carrying on the work of God. I saw them look up to the throne and pray. Father, give us thy spirit. Satan would then breathe upon them an unholy influence. And if there was light and much power in it, there was light and much power, but no sweet love, joy, and peace. Satan's object was to keep them deceived and to draw back and deceive God's children. Early Writings 56.1 Before the final visitation of God's judgments upon the earth, there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. The spirit and the power of God will be poured out upon his children with an ellipse. The enemy of souls desires to hinder this work, and before the time for such a movement shall come, he will endeavor to prevent it by introducing a counterfeit. In those churches which he can bring under his deceptive power, he will make it appear that God's special blessing is poured out. There will be manifest what is thought to be great religious interest. Multitudes will exult that God is working marvelously for them when the work is that of another spirit. Under a religious guise, Satan will seek to extend his influence over the Christian world. Okay, so he's, he's trying to make an argument that when Ellen White talks about the dispensation of the Holy Spirit, that it's referring to a period of time after 1844. Correct. Right, which I don't think is what she means, because she, she seems to interchangeably use the dispensation of the gospel the dispensation of grace, the dispensation of the Holy Spirit, um, as a reference to the time after Christ, not specifically to our time. Right. Now, the point that that I take... We can, see, and we can see why she uses that, because Christ says, when I go away, I'm going to send the comforter, right? Right. So, So that's what she means by the dispensation of the Spirit, but he's trying to give it here a meaning that refers to the time in which apostate Protestantism is working. 
Now, his next statement. To understand the prophecy of Daniel 11 is to understand how these persecuting powers work against God's people. I find it sad that he wants to phrase everything thinking that these persecuting powers, as he's saying it, paganism, papalism, apostate Protestantism, work together. Each of these three powers has a distinct role to play as a counterfeit to the Godhead. Paganism portrays God the Father as an angry God, someone whom we must appease in order to obtain his favor. Papalism teaches that works and the confessional replace the merits and intercession of Christ, and the work of the third power is to counterfeit the office and the operation of the Holy Spirit. The outward manifestations of this false outpouring of the Holy Spirit will be seen in miracles, healings, and such, but it is the inward working on the mind that gives this counterfeit such power. As apostate Protestantism matures into spiritualism, it has the greater power to deceive and to ensnare. Here he wishes to quote and tell us that this is supported by Great Controversy 588.2. Yeah, which it doesn't. So in Great Controversy 588.1, right, uh, we're going to have this, which is where I would start. Through two great, the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring under, bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. And under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. So then he wants us to look at the next paragraph. As spiritualism more closely imitates the nominal Christianity of the day, it has greater power to deceive and ensnare. Satan himself is converted after the modern order of things. He will appear in the character of, the, of an angel of light. Through the agency of spiritualism, miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, and many undeniable wonders will be performed. And as the spirits who profess faith in the Bible and manifest respect for the institutions of their church, their work will be accepted as a manifestation of divine power. So first off, we can see that spiritualism is not Protestantism. Right. Right? Because the United right. States represents Protestantism. Spiritualism is another power, just as the papacy is another power. So he, he has kept this idea in front of us that Protestantism slash spiritualism is this final power. But he hasn't he hasn't proven it. And definitely the great controversy 588.1 and 2 do not support what he's saying. Correct. Now, it should be of extreme interest to us that Satan commenced the rapping delusion in New York in 1844. Great Controversy 553, paragraphs 1 and 2, CET, I'm not familiar with that, 168, an early writing. That's CET's uh, Christian Experience and Teachings. Okay. Early writings, 86 to 87. Just as the French Revolution marked the rise of atheism, so the rapping in New York marks the rise of modern spiritualism. This is where Satan makes his own move from the scattering to the gathering, from counterfeiting the work of Christ to the counterfeit work of the Holy Spirit. This is his final work, preparatory to his impersonation of Christ. Just as the Holy Spirit testifies of Christ, so spiritualism testifies of Satan. Just as the three angels prepare for the arrival of Christ, so the three persecuting powers prepare for the arrival of Satan. Christ demonstrates the end from the beginning, so Satan does the same by way of counterfeit. In this period, in this time period of gathering, Satan is determined to unite the world into one body by sweeping all into the ranks of spiritualism. Great Controversy 
4.3 is where he wishes us to believe his proof resides. The true understanding of the three angels' message of Revelation 14 are our only safeguard against this delusion. And the rejection of these messages at this time in earth's history will result in the acceptance of spiritualism. So in uh, 588.3 in the Great Controversy, the line of distinction between professed Christians and the ungodly is now hardly distinguishable. Church members love what the world loves and are ready to join with them. And Satan determines to unite them in one body and thus strengthen his cause by sweeping all into the ranks of spiritualism. Right, which we, we see beginning to happen, obviously, that, that Christianity has, you know, there's many Christian ministers that are really just teaching spiritualism. A papist who boasts of miracles as a certain sign of the true church will be readily deceived by this wonder-working power, and Protestants having cast away the shield of truth will also be deluded. Papists, Protestants, and worldlings will alike accept the form of godliness without the power. And they will see in this union a grand movement for the conversion of the world and the ushering in of a long expected millennium. Now, I'm just going to read the next paragraph. Through spiritualism, Satan appears as a benefactor of the race, healing the diseases of the people and professing to present a new and more exalted system of religious faith. But at the same time, he works as a destroyer. His temptations are leading multitudes to ruin. Intemperance dethrones reason. Sensual indulgence, strife, and bloodshed follow. Satan delights in war, for it excites the worst, worst passions of the soul. And then he sweeps into eternity its victims steeped in vice and blood. It is his object to incite the nations to war against one another, for he can thus divert the minds of the people from the work of preparation to stand in the day of God. Right, so... I mean, in the context of all of this, he's he's misusing Ellen White's quotes, right? Right. It's not saying what he says it's saying. So he, he he's basically saying, well, they're all just spiritualism because, well, spiritualism is going to pervade each of these. But we can see that the United States is joining with these powers. It's it's made a league. And, and the way that we put that is it's connected to what happened with 1989, reaching uh, across the Gulf, right, to unite with, uh, can't remember. There's two different ways in which Alan White says it. There's the one in 5T. But anyway, he reaches over to join with the papal power, and then he reaches to join with spiritualism. And so we understand the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet to represent the dragon representing spiritual power that's going to represent the world in the sense of um, sort of a secular humanistic atheistic ideas you know the worship of nature and all those types of things then you have the papacy which is a, a counterfeit of christ's heavenly ministry right and then you have protestantism right so you have these these three powers they still are you know, they're they're all in a in a sense going to be swept up in what we call spiritualism, but you can't say that the Protestant uh, America, the, the false prophet, be, is product. You know, the false prophet slash spiritualism, right? That wouldn't make any sense. It doesn't become the dragon power. It's just united with it. Right. That's what we see happening here in Great Controversy right. is these powers uniting with spiritualism and spiritualism becomes this uniting force because Christianity has fallen and spiritualism has has captivated it. And, and the papacy is also tied to spiritualism. But you, you know, they're not the same powers like the papacy is not spiritualism as a power. It's the papacy. It's the it's the beast. The false prophet, even though it's influenced by spiritualism and has spiritualistic aspects, it still is the false prophet. And the dragon power is spiritualism. Right. So so he doesn't. The thing I don't like, I mean, there's lots of things I don't like, but he never addresses the objections that we would have. Right. Right. He, he, 
he leads us down a line of thinking, thinking, but he's he's not being transparent and he's not addressing these obvious problems with his his ideas, right? He he's ignoring them. And now, obviously, you know, we're discerning. You know, we've studied these these things in detail, some of us for decades, right? So we're not going to be misled, but there are some people who would be. I'm not sure what audience that he would have that would actually read this to be misled. But, you know, he's definitely misled himself. And, and he's, not, he's not openly looking and at, asking these questions and answering them in the paper, which, which I would do. If I have an idea that I recognize affects other ideas that I've thought in the past and that other people think, I'm going to present that, right? I'm going to present those objections that I would have in my own mind and show why I, those objections aren't valid or what I saw wrong. And he's not doing that, which, which bothers me because you have to do it. You know, there's no way you can just ignore things. This, the situation that, that has occurred here Mm -hmm. over the last several years, he has believed that he has been called to ministry. He has had others that have given commitments to him where they say that they are willing to support his stated goal of ministry because he believes that the ministry that he was to give was to be to people in Alaska. Over the last several years, he has had multiple parties that have given very substantial donations. Some of these were donations of materials and equipment. Many of these donations have been lost. Now, well, I yeah, I don't know if that's relevant for us studying this. I understand. (laughs) Um, Because, you know, those are types of things like, I don't know. You know, I'm not there. I don't generally like to talk about things like that that I don't know but you know you may know um but the so because the reason we're examining these things is we're really examining ourselves right that's the purpose here and and we're trying to understand okay we we've gone through this study we've come to conclusions with Daniel chapter 11 and 12 and 10 right after more than a year of study and so we we then look at at, at this this um, study from your friend Glenn, and we're quite we're quite amazed at at the contrast between how we studied and he studied. And so there is this natural sort of reaction. Okay, well, you know, like we don't know what's going on here, but we need to know how how we think. And, and in some ways, I could say that that we're not all that different from him, I think, in nature. That is, human beings, without the Holy Spirit instructing us, we can believe a lot of things, right? We, we, have, uh, we, can, we can just jump to confusions about stuff, right? We can think some ideas. We can have beliefs. I've seen... I've seen it in myself and others where, you know, we believe something because, well, it makes sense to us. But as as we examine our own hearts, as we go through Christian experiences, God corrects us. And, you know, he so when we look at at Miller's rules, because he keeps bringing up Miller's rules. And and yet Miller's rules are not being followed at all. And, and this is what I generally see when people bring up Miller's rules all the time is, is they bring them up sort of as a smoke screen, especially within this movement. Oh, we're going to follow Miller's rules. You know, and they might quote one or two of them, but not follow them. Right. It's just really common. It, it's, it just gives an impression that you are following Miller's rules, even though you're not. So, so we look at the rules and we, we look at how we study. So when, when he goes into this, this other um, section dealing with his estate, 
Mm -hmm. We're going to follow Miller's rules and show how he's not following them at all. But the question is, you know, how, how does this relate to us? Like, what is it that we need to learn from this experience that he's going through and that we have gone through? And, you know, there is all of these factors, these external things, which, which I don't want to know about, right? I mean, I want to know, I mean, to me, it's, it's somewhat interesting that he believes he's got a call to ministry, right? And that people are, are supporting him. We know that, uh, we're, we're part of a movement or a movement that probably doesn't exist anymore <laughs> that, you know, took a lot of people's money you know, built up a school of the prophets and seemed to have a message. And I believe it was of God, but, you know, failed in its goals, right? What, what, what it believed it was going to do. Now God had other plans. So, you know, and it's not really about money here, but, um, but you can see how people, people think that just because I I'm called to ministry, because I mean, we we all should be called to ministry, shouldn't we? Right. <laughs> I mean, I was called to ministry when I was five years old, right? God showed me plainly that 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 you know I was called to ministry, but I never knew what that meant, of course, when I'm five years old. But but there is a ministry. My ministry has mostly been to you know guitar students and customers in the guitar store. <laughs> That's been my ministry, um, you know, somewhat to Adventist, you know, being a member of a church, you have some ministry there. But none of that means that I'm sort of fallible or that, you know, that somehow God has endowed me with some abilities and you just need to, you know, I need to get people to accept my ideas. Um, I believe that we need to study together and that, you um, that unity comes through God's spirit working upon each individual, right? So I believe that we need to be transparent, that when we study, we're studying to know what is truth, that we're all brethren, right? There's no, no one with authority to say, well, you need to accept what, you know, what I said, or even what a group of people has said, um, just because this group of people is somehow endowed with authority, right? Because all authority comes from God through the scriptures. And each person themselves has to submit to that authority alone. Fellowship should not have authority, right? So I'm always leery when people have an idea that, that they're called to some ministry and because they see some certain truth that no one else sees. And then for that reason, we need to listen to them. And that's a dangerous position to be in. And I, I know there are some people who want to put me in that position. Like they would say, well, you know, you've got all this light and, you know, we should just kind of follow you. And that, of course, is extremely dangerous because one is Ellen White says when we put a man in the place of Christ or of God, all of the wisdom that God had given that person will be removed. And I don't want my wisdom being removed. Right. So, so you can see the dangers that, that lie in, in, in how we're studying and, and the approach that we use for authority. Now, he's not really making an appeal to himself as an authority here in this paper, which is good. But he has an idea that he's presenting to us, and he's doing it, I would say, in a deceitful manner, or at least in not a transparent manner. I don't know if you agree with me on that. No, he's not been transparent with this. Okay. The situation as as we proceed through this mm -hmm. is there are many influences, external influences that he tells us he's set aside, but that he is accepted and that are prevalent in the manner in which he is approaching the study. Okay. You know, and, and he, and, and the other thing, you know, he gives this, I, I would say lip service, the true understanding of the three angels messages of revelation 14 are only safeguard against this delusion. Right. Right. 
what what are those messages? Has he even has he even really addressed them? Right. Again, as you're saying, he is telling us one thing here, but doing something else over here. So mm-hmm. there, it, there, there's quite a bit of misdirection that's occurring. Yeah, sleight of hand. Correct. Um, because when we talk about the three angels' messages in this movement, we understand what they are. One is they represent a line, a reform line. And so we set things on a line to help us understand them. It's, it's, it's part of an analytical tool to, to examine the past, to examine our own personal experiences, to examine the movement. But people use this three angels message or third angels message sometime without ever defining what it is, right? They might just say, well, it has something to do with righteousness by faith. But, but they don't even know why it's called the third angel's message. You know exactly what happened. What are the first and second? How, what is the third angel's message doing? Why does it arrive? Like all of these things are important uh, details, but he's never going to address it. So if he's saying this is our only safeguard against this delusion, wouldn't he be presenting the three angels' messages instead of this strange idea? Correct. Now, his next, his next two quotations. From Spalding and McGann, I saw that the two-horned beast had a dragon's mouth and that his power was in his head and that the decree should go out of his mouth. Then I saw the mother of harlots, that the mother was not the daughters but separate and distinct from them. She has had her day, and it is past, and her daughters, the Protestant sects, were the next to come on the stage and to act out the same mind that the mother had when she persecuted the saints. I saw that as the mother had been declining in power, the daughters had been growing, and soon they will exercise the power once exercised by the mother. From Science of the Times, November 1st, 1899. And when the papacy, robbed of its strength, was forced to desist from persecution, John beheld a new power coming up to echo the dragon's voice and carry forward the same cruel and blasphemous work. This power, the last that is to wage war against the church and the law of God, was symbolized by a beast with lamb-like horns. The beasts preceding it had risen from the sea. But this came up out of the earth, representing the peaceful rise of the nation, which it symbolized. The two horns like a lamb well represent the character of the United States government, as expressed in its two fundamental principles, republicanism and Protestantism. These principles are the secret of our power and the prosperity as a nation. Those who first found an asylum on the shores of America rejoiced that they had reached a country free from the arrogant claims of popery and the tyranny of kingly rule. They determined to establish a government upon the broad foundation of civil and religious liberty. Now, as we pay attention to this, Glenn would have us understand that this other power that is to wage war against the church and the law of God are Protestants. But, Mrs. White is clear in this quotation that, but this came up out of the earth representing the peaceful rise of the nation, which is symbolized. Yeah, so, so, so the false prophet is Protestant America. Right. That is, it has these two aspects. And we know that the Protestant horn fell in Millerite history and the Republican horn falls in our history, right? Correct. So these things are precursors to, you know, having the Sunday law and all, and all those things. So, yeah, he just tends to not be really, he doesn't really define things well. He sort of moves around his terms. His next statement, there are two distinct transfers of power shown in these quotes. The first is from papalism to Protestantism. And the second is from the fifth kingdom of the papacy to the sixth kingdom, that of the United States of America. 
the one is a religious transfer and the other is civil transfer. Right, which which is not shown by these statements. Right. Right, so he's trying to create that there's these two different, two di he's separating the United States from Protestantism in a sense and separating papalism from the papacy, which is kind of odd. But he's, he's going to have like, Papalism is just a religious idea. The papacy itself is a civil idea. Right. Which he hasn't shown. And, and none of these quotes that he uses support what he say. Now he segues to this. This brings us to a concept in the prophecy that can be difficult to grasp. Up until the time of the end, around the 1798 time period, the major persecuting power of God's people had been administered in the forms of paganism and papalism. These two powers are responsible for the overall scattering of God's people. So is he saying paganism and papalism are political, civil powers, or are they religious powers? I believe his, I believe his overall point would be that they were religious powers. But it's political powers that are going to I mean, religious powers don't cause the scattering of God's people. Right. Right. Those are governments. Those are the kingdoms of Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, and Rome. Well, the the reason I'm say I'm I'm making the assumption as I am is yeah. the paragraph we read before, his specific words are related to the as he says it, the direct distinct transfer of power. The first right. to Protestantism, which, as he is seeing it, is a religious transfer. Mm -hmm. And from the fifth kingdom to the sixth kingdom being a civil transfer. So I would have to say that he is saying that this is a religious situation. So he's not making the distinction here that the ones that really do the scattering are not religious ideas that do the scattering. He, he's yeah. because, I mean, historically, that's not the case, right? It's going to be correct. The scattering is done by by these kingdoms, um, not the religions or the philosophies of these kingdoms. Right. Right. The philosophy of Babylon does not cause the scattering of God's people. It's actually the government of Babylon, <laughs> right? That causes the scattering. Right. They don't, they don't infiltrate Judaism and cause them to uh, uh, accept Babylon. You know, when it comes to Judah, they accept their philosophy and that causes their scattering. They're, they're scattered because Babylon comes in and carries them away. Right. Right. And same with, of course, with Northern kingdom as well. Right. I mean, you could say, well, they had some false worship in there, and so that's why God allowed them to be scattered, and that would be true. But the actual scattering itself is done by the governments, literally taking people and scattering. And I'm not sure what he means by the over for the overall scattering of God's people. So maybe maybe that word overall is something where he's attaching some philosophical idea. But, of course, we know the scattering was accomplished by 538. He's going to have it being from 1798. Yeah, so he's he's looking at this with 1,260 intervening years because this next paragraph. But now from 1798 forward, the scattering has been accomplished. The scattering time period is identical with and the same time as the indignation of verse 36 and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished that is the papacy as the second half of the indignation will prosper in its role for 1260 years as a desolating scattering power of god's people until 1798 the indignation covers the entire time period of the scattering of god's people beginning in 722 bc and ending in 1798 to 1844. These are the same two powers represented in the question asked in Daniel 
How long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? Here again, paganism and papalism are represented successively as the persecutors of God's people. Yeah, so so obviously we know that uh, when he says the scattering and the indignation are the scattering time period and the indignation are identical. We can say, well, they're not. But he hasn't proven any of this. Right. This he, is he's telling us things, but he never shows us these things. He's not doing a, a study to show us any of this. So we have all of these premises that are being put in front of us. Sometimes, you know, conclusions put in front of us that we just have to blindly accept. And, and some of them are really just counterintuitive. They're not, they're not something that you would just, you would just assume. And, and lots of them, his conclusions don't follow logically from his premises. So he's not showing us any of this, but, but we can quite say that the scattering time period is not identical with the indignation, that the indignation, that there are two ends of the indignation, the first end being paganism and the second end being papalism so when the indignation is accomplished of course the papacy has an indignation and so does paganism so so we do understand that there are these two successive uh desolating powers right the two 1260s which still he has 722 bc i wish i knew why he has that the the problem that i'm seeing here yes he keeps referring to 722 bc in a in a small way, attempting to change a way mark. The, uh, well, the, the bigger of the issues is now he wishes to include the period from 1798 to 1844 as being part of the scattering. Yeah, which which he had kind of alluded to before because he's going to have uh, from 722 to um, 677, 46 years, even though it's 45, but. So I'm not sure why he's doing that as a sort of you need that before you have um, like that begins the scattering. So he has this really sort of these beginnings and ends in which the scattering begins like a precursor to it building up and then the scattering starting and then the scattering ending. But it ends in this period of 46 years. That's kind of what he's arguing. But. But he's not addressing the fact that these are actually two different 2520s. Right. Right. You have the one for northern Israel. That is going to end in 1798, where now Protestantism is going to be tested under the first angel's message. The 2520 for Judah brings us to 1844 and to God having a denominated people again. Right. Correct. So, so the people that are gathered after 1844 is referencing the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Judah. The people that are gathered after 1798 are the Protestants, which are going to become the false prophet, right? Okay. Right, so the United States rises in 1798. It's given this opportunity, Protestant America is given this message, the first angel's message, an opportunity to accept it. It's going to be rejected by the vast majority, right? Many Protestants accept it for a time, but, you know, they ultimately end up rejecting it when it doesn't happen the way that they expect. He's not addressing any of these points. He's not making these distinctions. He's not even addressing, really, the gathering of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Right. He's not really addressing the prophetic mirror as we understand it. It's almost as if to him, the prophetic mirror doesn't exist. He's simply going to have 723 or 722 in this case to 1844. Right. right? So he's not going to have the 19 years at the beginning, the 19 years at the end. That That's what it seems like to me. Right. Now, he wishes to have this presented as if it is from spirit of prophecy mean having it in in italics and blue 
Lou. Now, who is it that he's quoting? Well, I'm assuming from the way that this is presented that he is trying to present that this was quoted from Science of the Times, November 1st, 1899. Okay. Where is it from? Is it? I haven't. Okay, well, I'll just check it out. Okay. Yeah, I mean, because that's what it looks like he's doing. The, what he is presenting here says, through paganism and then through the papacy, Satan exerted his power for many centuries in an effort to blot from the earth God's faithful witnesses. Pagans and papists were actuated by the same dragon spirit. So if we look this up as same dragon spirit. I looked up pagans and papists. Okay. So this is from November 1st, 1899. Okay. It's interesting. It's got the signs of the times, November 1st, 1899, but the initial um, reference would have also been from manuscript 51 of 1899. Okay. Okay. Well, here's what the whole paragraph says. Through paganism, then through the papacy, Satan exerted his power for many centuries in an effort to blot from the earth God's faithful witnesses. Pagans and papists were actuated by the same dragon spirit. They differed only in that the papacy making a pretense of serving God was the more dangerous and cruel foe. Uh, Through the agency of Romanism, Satan took the world captive. The professed church of God was swept into the ranks of this delusion And for more than a thousand years, the people of God suffered under the dragon's ire. And when the papacy, robbed of its strength, was forced to desist from persecution, John beheld a new power coming up uh, to echo the dragon's voice and carry forward the same cruel and blasphemous work. This power, the last that is to wage war against the church and the law of God, was symbolized by a beast with lamb-like horns. The beast preceding it had risen from the sea, but this came up out of the earth, representing the peaceful rise of the nation, which is symbolized. The two horns, like a lamb, well represent the character of the United States government as expressed in its two fundamental principles, republicanism and Protestantism. These principles are the secret of our power and prosperity as a nation, those who first found asylum. On the shores of America rejoiced that they had reached a country free from the arrogant claims of popery and the tyranny of kingly rule. They determined to establish a government upon the broad foundation of civil and religious liberty. Now, manuscript. So we know that it's going to, you know, uh, has horns, lamb like horns, but it will eventually speak as a dragon. Right. Manuscript 51 has a few minor changes, but is in, in pretty well agreement with this. So, here, from what you just read, we know that this is a nation, not a, a spiritual power. Mm -hmm. Yet he wishes in his next paragraph to go, but we are informed by John in the revelation that there's yet to be another distinct power that Satan brings to bear against God's people, apostate Protestantism. We can see the transition from paganism to papalism in Revelation 13, 1 to 3, and the transition from papalism to apostate Protestantism in Revelation 13, 11 to 14, Correspondingly, we also see the transition from paganism to papalism in Daniel 11.31. But do we see the transition from papalism to apostate Protestantism in Daniel 11? Daniel 11.38 is precisely where this transition occurs, but in his estate. Now, I'm heart sick about this because this is, I, I mean, This is just not a proper study. This is not a proper presentation. This is twisting things to make things fit. Now, am I wrong in in the way that I'm saying this? No. It is from this point that the papacy begins to work through through apostate Protestantism. The daughters are the operative power in the gathering time from 1843 onward. As we will see, even though the daughters are the next to come on the scene, the mother still retains control. In other words, apostate Protestantism now becomes the vehicle that the papacy uses to deliver her doctrines. 
This phrase in his estate occurs four times in chapter 11. And each time it occurs, authority is transferred from one entity to another. So here he wishes to quote Daniel 11, 7. But out of a branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate. He wishes historically to quote Ptolemy Philadelphus, the father succeeded by Ptolemy Eugetes, the son. Then Daniel 11, 20. Then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes. Julius Caesar, uncle, succeeded by Augustus Caesar, nephew. Daniel eleven twenty one, and in his estate shall stand up a vile person. Augustus Caesar, stepfather, succeeded by Tiberius Caesar, stepson. Daniel eleven thirty eight. But in his estate shall he honor the god of forces. Here, the presentation he wishes to change from papacy mother succeeded by apostate protestantism daughters so in other words this is a transgender representation i mean it says his estate his estate how can his estate be applied in the feminine form in the religious form mm-hmm yeah, so um, so when we we look at this, so he he's not doing a very good job with these uh, in how he's approaching his study. So he, on the surface, you could say, oh, he's following Miller's rules. He's looking at in his estate, and then he's comparing it. And so he says here, it has to be this same idea, right? Right. So so on the surface. You know, he's he's comparing now. But he's he's taking the ones here in Daniel 11. He's not looking at other verses. Correct. Right. Now, in Daniel 11, it's going to choose to translate the, the word can as a state. In other places, it's going to be base, put, right? Office. Office, yeah. And um, I'm just looking here at the Hebrew, so, uh, yeah, yeah, so that's interesting, masculine. So it's masculine singular in Daniel 11, verse 7. Okay. And then, and then in 20 and 21, we have two different ones. So we're going to have, uh, what's this here? Again, it's going to, it's, um, it's a little bit different. So you're going to have stand, masculine, singular, stand and stands, third per person, singular, masculine, singular. And then so it's going to it's going to say uh, upon his base, he shall stand upon his base. Now, when when we translate this in his estate or in his place, uh, we, we get the sense of an exchange, right? Correct. But it doesn't necessarily mean that when somebody stands upon his base, who's the his referring to? Isn't it the precedent? No. Okay. If I'm going to stand up on, upon, if you say he's going to stand upon his base, you could be referring to the person who's the one that's standing upon his base. And in 20 and 21, that's the grammatical structure. In 11, 7, it's different. Okay. Okay. So um, in both 11 and 21, it's the word uh, can, which is uh, uh, can o, right? It has the, the masculine singular for that word form. Uh, it's going to be preceded by uh, al. So he shall stand upon his base, means he's going to stand upon his base, not somebody else's base. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. Where they have translated in his estate in all of these places, but it doesn't say in his estate in verse 20 and 21. It's upon his base. Where in 11.7, you can translate it as in his place of the preceding one. 
So it's a completely different uh, grammatical structure. Um, in verse 38, I believe we get back to the same as 11, 7, but let me just see. No, this one's going to say, um, so here we have um, Vela Elahoa uh, is where it starts with. So um, yeah, here. So um, so the, the way the sentence is, I'm just telling you in Hebrew. So Lahoa, it means God, right? God. And then you're going to have the next word is uh, Ma'az, right? So this is the God of strength. We did a word study on this, remember? And, this is- and so when it talks about the God of strength, Who's it referring to? Like they translated the King James's forces, but when we do it, we did an actual word study on on the God of Maaz, right? In this case, Maazim. It's plural. So the God of strength is who? Well, that's that's part of the question. Our strength is to come from our heavenly Father, right? But we looked up the phrase, this phrase, and it was always a reference to God. Okay. To the Almighty God, right? Now, in the King James, it says, in his estate shall he honor the God of portrait, forces. But the God of forces is Almighty God. So, right? Okay. So this this is Mahazim? Is yeah. That... Mahazim, yeah. Maaz okay. is the singular, Mahazim is the plural. Okay. So going back to our 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 prior study, we have the God of forces, as it's translated here, or munitions, God's protectors. I mean, we have so many things that that are here in this God of forces. Except that when you have God of forces, it's always referring to Almighty God, right? Now, you can have the word forces, strength, being translated as munitions and different things. It would be the context there. But if you have the God of munitions, right, if you wanted to translate it that way, of strength, it still would always be referring to the true God, not to some false God, right? Because we, we we did the study on that. So we, we looked it up. So we could, if we look up God of strength, which is going to be the same thing. So I'm I'm asking a question as a refresher of what we covered before. Yeah. In one way, this can be translated as God of munitions. Is that correct? You could, but just munitions in the sense of the idea of strength. I would not translate it as munitions. Okay. The re- right. but there's a reason I'm, I'm bringing this up that way. Yeah. If we were to yet use Webster's 1828 dictionary, yeah. What does munition mean? What's the primary use of that word according to that dictionary? I don't know. What is it? Fortification. Okay. Yeah. So, no. which is why some people say the god of of fortifications instead of forces. Right. Now, what is the fortification that Rome uses? to defend themselves. But this isn't talking about Rome. Okay, well, I'm, I'm just asking a question. Uh, I don't know. What does Rome use to defend itself? Isn't it tradition? I don't know. I, I, don't, I, I wouldn't say that that's what it is. I mean, I, I look at fortifications as dealing with military power, if you're going to use it in fortifications. Okay, I just... I, I, I just don't think it's relevant to be talking here because we just don't understand the verse, like the verse as it shows up in the King James and and the way that he's using it. So he's going to say, basically, um, the God of forces is apostate Protestantism. Right. Which, of course, it can't be because that's actually God. So. So the way the way that we translated it because of. Uh, but as to the almighty God, shall he honor in his place? Yea, he shall honor a God whom his fathers knew not with gold, silver, and precious stones. Right? 
So we're just saying that um, that the God that he's going to honor is not the God of the forces, that he's going to he's going to honor someone else. Right. Right. So other than God, that that's the idea here of. Verse 38. So because in the context here, we're going to have this this. The king shall do according to his will. Right. All these different things. And he's not going to honor the God of strength, but he's going to honor a false God in the place of God. Right. Right. So that is he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Right. This this to me is connecting us to Second Thessalonians chapter two. So th this verse isn't doing what he, he thinks it's doing. Not at all. Right. So, and, and it, it is just kind of weird why the King James translates it this way. I mean, because God of strength is the first part of the verse. Now, you know, they're trying to make sense out of Hebrew. Sometimes you order things around. But it's basically uh, the God of forces or the God of strength upon his place. The, the word that they have here is... Uh, literally trans would be translated as as heaviness um and that's the uh the peel form of the imperfect third person masculine singular and then you're going to have a consecutive vob you're going to have again the god right mm -hmm. so that's going to be vala elahova right so so basically it's a very strange form, but anyway, the God, the God which uh, not, which not, they did know their fathers, right? That is, their fathers did not know. And, um, and so that word heavy, that would be worship, I guess. Uh, they're translating this worship. Or no, I guess, maybe it's no, not really sure heavy what Yakabed. yes yeah, so that would be uh okay yeah sometimes these hebrew idioms i guess honor okay honor is how we would translate that and then he's going to honor these with gold silver precious stones etc so the idea of the hebrew sentence um is that uh the god of strength who he should honor in his place, he's not going to honor, but he's going to honor another God instead. That's right. the idea that's here, right? I mean, it's it's hard to really translate it. I understand it in a sense why the King James translators translated it the way they did, because it is kind of an awkward sentence even in Hebrew. But But the idea is that there's the almighty God, the God of forces, who that he should have honored in his place, right? Instead, he's going to honor this strange God that his fathers did not know in his place. He's going to honor him instead because he's not going to honor the God he should honor. And so, yeah, when you look at this in the King James, uh, again, but in his state shall he honor the God of for forces. But it doesn't say that. <laughs> right. Okay. It, it, what it says is the God of for, forces who he should honor in his place, in his estate. He doesn't, right? A God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor. And he's going to do this with gold, silver, precious stones and pleasant things, right? So that to me is the idea that the, that the sentence has. It would be hard kind of to translate that like literally into English, because it doesn't make sense. Like if I translated it just literally, yeah. So, uh, yeah, and then that kabod. See, uh, kabod, which is translated as honor, means glory. So you could say that the glory of God in his place, he does not honor, but he honors a strange God. Right, so this is Second Thessalonians chapter two, right? Okay. Right. He shall sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. 
right? This, this is what's being described in this verse. It's not showing a transfer from one power to another. So that premise is incorrect. Yes. And, and, it's, and it's not really supported by the preceding verses that he, that he takes, because in his estate, these are, um, in the first one only, is it dealing with a transfer? Okay. Now, we, we're coming to the close of today's session, and we, need, we have a lot to address yet with this idea in hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, are, the, the only thing I can say, just that kind of in closing. Okay. Um, so, you know, you and I are a bit disturbed by this. Very much. Partly, you know, you're disturbed because he's a friend of yours and the direction that he's going, the things that he's saying that, that bothers you because you care about him. And then, you know, I don't know him personally, but this just reminds me of so many other things. Like, I guess the thing that I struggle with the most as, as a person is there is a thing that is true and you wish everyone could see the truth, right? right? We don't want people to see the truth. And you see how, how difficult it is for people to see the truth. That is, people can come to know the things like the Sabbath and the state of the dead and, you know, the, some of the doctrines of Scripture. But they can go off in these other directions. And, and we see all these winds of doctrine go floating around Adventism. Right. And, and, and we also get labeled as a wind of doctrine. Right. You know, because people don't take the time to actually study what we say. But, you know, so we have this problem. We have this problem that there is this truth and the Holy Spirit wants to teach us. And we need to know how to study. And there's so much lip service to studying. You know, we saw it within the movement, you know, methodology they talked about. We even talked about line upon line and how that was important. And, and yet people would say, Here's how we need to study, and then they wouldn't do it. Right. Right. Which drives me crazy. It's like, well, if you know how to study, why can't you study that way? And and so, and there's nothing you can do about it. You know, as a guitar teacher, I can tell my guitar students, here's how you need to practice. And I can explain it a thousand different ways. I can set out a, a program for them. You know, here's how much you need to practice this and this and this, you know. 10 minutes of scales, you know, 10 minutes of drills, you know, um, some sight reading, all this kind of stuff. But if they don't do it, it's not going to benefit them. Right. And, and we know that the primary reason that we study is not to get a bunch of knowledge so that we can tear down other people, make ourselves appear smarter or better or something than others. But we study so that we can see our own spiritual condition. And so the reason we don't study correctly is that the correct way of study is humbling. It's humiliating, right, to human nature. Right. And so we create all kinds of barriers so that we don't actually address who we are. We don't want to see our true spiritual condition. And, and and we need to recognize when we can see it in others, it's easy to see things in others. It's much more difficult to see those things in ourselves. But that's why God has given us this method of study. And and so so we have to make sure that when we study like this, you know, we're not exalting, oh, see, this person's wrong and we're right, and so we're better, right? Because that's that's a natural temptation. We need to see that God is trying to show us something and we need to be corrected. You know, uh, an example of this is on uh, the Unity Chat, where I'm having this discussion with Heliomar, whoever he is. And, you know, he, he had this idea that there's an actual 120 days from the first day of the first month to the first day of the fifth month. So I just thought, you know, I'd remind him that there's actually some months that have 29 days. He won't accept it. And it frustrates me that someone can be so, like, I'm not sure why, right? You know, you try to assert, why Why are you not accepting this? Is it you don't like to be corrected? Like, you can easily see that there's 118 days from April 19th 
to August 15th? Are you not accepting that? Right? Never answers that question. So, you know, this is a problem that we have. We have in ourselves and we have with other people. And so we're, it's something that we're really going to have to, to address in our own lives, right? Because we want to know the truth, but that's going to be difficult. It's every time you are shown the truth, you're shown something about yourself. I guess that's the, the main point. I know that this day is about, um, you're about to wrap up, but I'm going to ask this question. I probably should ask it later, but where's the mother two days in that? In that? It's just a question. I know it's, I know, uh, yeah, I, I know it's spiritual, but I want to know where, why is it just not 118 instead of 120? Why is it 118 days from the first day of the first month? Because there's two months that have 29 days. Okay. All right. right. That was my question. I just wanted to check. I know it's spiritual, but I just wanted to check. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the thing is, some see, some people think that, well, the months actually have 30 days in them, right? Because in prophetic time, we say a month has 30 days. But we know in actual literal time, that's not the case, Right. They sometimes have 30 and sometimes have 29. There's there's more times there's 30 days in a month than 29. Um, you know, so so we so we know that, but you know, people just don't know how the calendars work. But he's trying to argue that there's actually 120 days, at least that's what I think he's arguing. And I said, well, you know, 120 days is a symbol, right? But it's actually 118. It just I was just like letting him know, right? But he won't accept it. And and so we have to say, well, if we don't accept something that's true, like we need to really examine our own hearts. Why we don't accept things. Why when somebody presents something to us, if it's new to us or we didn't understand it before, what's the barrier in our own hearts of not accepting something? That's what we should be learning here. Anyway. Right. Okay. Any other thoughts, comments, or questions at this time? Until tomorrow, shall we then close with prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for all that you are doing in our lives. We realize, Father, that we fall short from your glory and that we need you to help us, to purify us, to make us ready for your kingdom. I thank you for each one that has participated in this study today. I thank you for each that have listened and attended. Be with us now, Father, as we go through this day. May your will be done. May we be able to properly honor your character and your name. For this we thank you. For this we praise you. Now and always, in Jesus' name, amen.